as we come to um, Easter season and we dwell here in this piece of um, the Easter message. Um, Let me pray for us and then we will jump into John chapter 15. Father, we thank you for your word. Father, we thank you that you have given us these teachings from the lips of our Lord Jesus Christ. And in your sovereignty, by your spirit, you have seen fit to preserve them for us. Father, it is with great humility that we walk into this teaching. And we trust that you would use it. We thank you that you have declared to us that your spirit deploys your word named the sword of the spirit and that you do it in such a way that he accomplishes his specific purposes, that he accomplishes your specific purposes, Father, in each of our lives. We would ask that that would happen today, that you would glorify yourself by showing us who you are and that we would be transformed. We thank you that we can trust you that way. We ask all of this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. John chapter 15 beginning in verse 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean, because of the word I have spoken to you. Abide in in me, and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do Nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask Whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Okay. As I mentioned, um, this is a, a long sermon by Jesus covering many chapters. An important teaching is unfolding through this part of the book of John. If we were to start at the beginning of uh, Jesus' sermon, he would have addressed us and said, let not your hearts be troubled. Because his disciples were facing a situation where it would be reasonable for their hearts to be troubled. Jesus teaches this so their hearts don't have to be troubled. Um, And to just catch us up to speed He has taught his disciples that he's preparing a place. He has taught his disciples that he will return. Even as he leaves, he will return. And he's taught his disciples that he is the way. So as we begin chapter 15... This is the moment when Jesus is teaching something new. Now, this new teaching is a big part of what it means to walk in the new covenant, to walk in the spirit, to walk with Christ, living the Christian life.
This new teaching's theological name is union with Christ. And we are invited to walk in this new teaching, which isn't new. It's the heartbeat of the gospel. And it begins with a call to abide. In verse 1, Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. So, the Son is the vine, and the Father is the vine dresser. And that means a gardener or a farmer who specifically takes care of vines. So the metaphor is introduced right here. A careful farmer in a true vine. The father is the vine dresser. The son is the vine. And Jesus is going to use this metaphor throughout this part of the passage to teach us the things that he wants us to know. So when we see verse 2, we begin to see the activity of what vine dressers do. And what vine dressers do is they prune, they cut. Their, um, their most important tool throughout history is the best knife they can find. Today they have two knives put together. We've seen those at Home Depot. But the vine dresser was always cutting. This is what vine dressers do. It's the most important part of taking care of a vine. It's the most important part of seeing grapes grow. And in this passage, we have two kinds of cutting. Those two kinds of cutting are in verse 2. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. So there's lots of cutting going on there. The first kind is he takes away branches that do not bear fruit. Okay, this is not the disciples. He's talking to his disciples. Um, the vine dresser does that. Takes away branches that don't bear fruit. But then we find that he prunes branches that produce fruit. Now that just seems wrong if you're not a vine dresser. It just seems wrong. A perfectly good branch bearing perfectly good fruit, and he comes with his knife and he cuts it off. What is he thinking? Well, He's thinking he's trying to produce fruit from these vines. And that's what you do. He does that, it says, so that they will bear more fruit. This is what grape growers do. They attack their crops. If we went to wine country along 44 at the right season, we would see vine dressers attacking the crops. And that'd be really weird. Scientifically, what's going on is something like this. Now, it's really fun to use the word scientifically when I'm going to do what I'm about to do, because I'm going to personify a branch of a vine, okay? So a branch is there, and scientifically, the branch is feeling all alive, and the branch is seeing some fruit, and the branch is very impressed with itself. <laughs> and all of those branches have the possibility 
of becoming vines. And they're thinking, scientifically, if branches could think. But deep in there somewhere is the knowledge that I could become my own vine. And, um, and you can do that. We got some blackberries in the backyard of my house, and if you uh, bend the vine down and stick it into the ground and let it grow a while, then you cut it, it's a whole new vine, okay? So, so you can do that. And within a branch, scientifically, is this kind of desire to be impressed and to be its own vine. Well, um, God wants fruit. And the vine dresser wants fruit too. So scientifically, the vine dresser attacks that branch, whops it right off. And the vine says, ouch. And the vine realize, the branch realizes that it needs that vine. And so instead of growing out to try to become a new vine, it grabs hold of its vine. And that branch that has been attacked receives nutrients from the vine like it never had before. That branch is now ready to produce fruit because it's been trained to depend upon its vine, its source of water, its source of nutrients, its source of everything it needs to thrive. Now, other imagery that's used in the Bible to communicate a similar idea is the refiner's fire that takes ore and burns off of the junk, leaving pure, precious metal. Suffering does this. One of the really great things about the Bible's witness to the body of Christ is that we can know that our suffering is not purposeless. Now we might not understand it and it might be caused by evil things that we would never want, but we can know that it's never purposeless. God uses it to bear in each of us fruit. Suffering does that. The Lord's discipline does that. When we as a branch feeling important try to go out on our own, the Lord is faithful to discipline us so that we can cling to the true branch. Not punish us, discipline us. Discipline is for the sake of growth. Discipline is for the sake of fruit. Discipline is for the sake of maturity. God doesn't do this in anger. God disciplines those he loves, that they will be more fruitful. So you might be asking, what is fruit in this metaphor of the vine? What is fruit? We're going to look at that just a little bit later. So I'm going to ask you to hold on to that question. And I, I hope you're asking that question. It's the logical right question to what we're talking about. But hold on to it for just a second. Now, I, I think Jesus realizes that what he said was pretty radical and pretty disturbing being taken away and thrown away, being cut even if you uh, were bearing fruit. And so he assures, reassures his disciples in verse 3. He says, already you are clean because the word that I have spoken to you, 
You are already, already you are clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Now, just before this sermon starts, back in chapter 13, before the sermon starts in 14, we will find Jesus washing his disciples' feet. And um, Peter, first, if you remember the story, didn't want his feet washed. And then when Jesus says, you need your feet washed, Peter says, well, then wash all of me. And Jesus says, no, your, your feet will be fine. You are already clean. And um, Jesus is reminding those gathered in this upper room, he is declaring that they are clean because of his word. We come to verse 4. Abide in me, and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, and neither can you unless you abide in me. So we have a command here. Abide. Abide. Um, we notice that that goes two directions. He says, abide in me. So he's saying to his disciples, Jesus speaking, abide in me. And I'm going to be abiding in you. Abide in me, and I in you. So as he extends, as he, as he keeps working with the metaphor, he tells the branch, branch, you can't bear fruit by itself. There's no way a branch is going to bear any fruit unless it's connected to its vine. And um, just, just in case we're slow, he says, and yes, I'm talking to you about abiding in me. A branch can't bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. Can't do it by yourself. You must abide in me. So what does abiding mean? Well, literally, it means to remain to dwell, to cling, to uh, stay connected. To cling, as I said. It's important. How do we do it? Well, we'll look at that a little bit later, and he develops that more as the sermon continues. So if you choose to take my suggestion and dwell in these chapters between now and Easter, uh, mark the places where Jesus is explaining how to abide in him, how to make sure you are a branch abiding in the vine. But for now, when you hear abide and you want to begin to answer the question how, think obey, love, and depend. Obey, love, and depend. And a big component of that depend is to trust or to exercise our faith to trust. We'll have a good start in abiding as we do those things. And as we think about how, we get some amazing encouragement right here. Because the Holy Spirit is the agent of the abiding. Remember, Jesus says, you in me and I in you. So we don't abide 
independently as the rugged individualist that Missourians are trained to be. And um, I don't know how many of you are Missourians. I'm a fifth generation Missourian. That means I can resemble that mule. Um, I am knit by my culture and by my background to be a rugged individual. I can do it or I will fail. And your helping of me feels a little bit like communism, like I'm from Wisconsin or something. <laughs> um, so, so, so those of you that are native Missourians like me, God has work to do in us, doesn't he? He certainly does. But you see, he doesn't invite us to abide the way I just described. The Holy Spirit is abiding in you even as he invites you to abide in him. So we truly can be dependent upon him. You and me, when we abide in Christ, we find our identity, we find our standing, we find our position in him. We have the privilege of being in Christ. When you read Paul's letters, and he uses the little phrase, in Christ, it's, it's shorthand. Um, it's like text expander. Um, Mike just taught me text expander this week. But it's shorthand. It's a little spot where this whole idea of abiding and knowing that the Holy Spirit is committed to that abiding is in place. So uh, notice that, as you see in Christ, that is almost always the idea standing behind that little phrase. And then, I in you. So the first part was you in Jesus. Second part is Jesus in you. And when Jesus is in you, which he declares to be, um, that is where we find our power, our desire, and our ability in Christ. And it's the Holy Spirit that does this. And so what that means is there's a sense that you are in heaven with Jesus right now at the right hand of God. And then there's another sense that as you go tomorrow to work or to school or to whatever tomorrow brings you, Jesus is with you right in the midst of all of that. And both of those things are completely true simultaneously because we are in Christ and Christ is in us. It's a really big deal. And so, the metaphor is extended. In verse 5, Jesus says, I am the vine. Remember, the Father was the vine dresser. Jesus declares, you are the branches. Whoever does not abide in me and I, I'm sorry, whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. So I am the vine, Jesus says, you are the branches. We are to abide in him even as he is abiding, abiding in us. And when that happens, he declares much fruit will be born. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, no fruit at all can be born. So now's a good time to talk about that fruit. When we think 
of the fruit that the Spirit produces, the first thing we might think of is the fruit of the Spirit from the book of Galatians. I'm to remind you, um, Galatians 5, 22 and 23, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And, and that is part of the fruit that he is talking about. But there's more. Um, it, he also is talking about the fruit of seeing others impacted by the gospel. The fruit of seeing others impacted by the gospel. Because you see, when the dead become alive through the message, when the dead become alive through the message that we as the church and we as members have the privilege of declaring to our world, when that happens, it is fruit. It's fruit that's impossible to produce unless you're abiding in Jesus and Jesus is abiding in you and the Spirit is at work causing the fruit to be there. So the fruit of the Spirit and the impact in the lives of others by the message of the gospel, and even more, the fruit is everything done in conformity to the will of Jesus. All of that. Even the obedience itself. Because our flesh can't be obedient. My rugged individualism can never be obedient. We must depend upon Him. And it's all the fruit of the Spirit. Okay. Now in verse 6, we read, If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burnt. So there's a lot going on here. It's a really big deal. To not abide means that we're thrown away like a branch, that we wither like a branch. And the branches get gathered up and thrown into the fire to be burned. Now, if you are here today and you're not in a relationship with Jesus, if you haven't, through faith in him and his work on the cross, trusted him to forgive the sin that is separating you from God, and all sin separates us from God. If, um, if the, the truth of 2 Corinthians 5 is um, not, not at work, where, where Paul makes the amazing declaration that our sin is taken and it's placed upon Jesus so that he who has no sin becomes sin, and then he takes his righteousness and he gives it to those who give their sin to him. And the amazing declaration is that you may become the very righteousness of Christ. And right there in that message of reconciliation, that's what happens. If we're not in that relationship, if we haven't responded in faith to that invitation, then... We are being thrown away. We are withering. Rather than pruning, he is cutting off. To reject is to be excluded from the promise of blessing and left in isolation. And here Jesus calls that isolation fire. He um, chooses to emphasize that right here in this passage. 
But then he quickly turns. If anyone does not abide, that. And then in verse 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, then it says we are to ask whatever we wish and it will be done for us. Now remember the posture here is Jesus and you, you and Jesus. All right? It's not just any posture. It's the posture of abiding. Jesus and you, you and Jesus. And then... Jesus prays through us because of Jesus in you. So, so when you pray, Jesus is praying through you. And on the other side of that coin, because you are in him, when you pray, you pray in the very presence of the Father approved by Jesus. Well, that's pretty radical stuff. My, my heart wants to do gymnastics because that's too wonderful. It has to mean something else. But here, in this amazing moment, that's what Jesus declares. And, and should you follow my suggestion, you will see him declare it again and again throughout this passage. So um, Jesus is praying through us. We're praying in the heavenly presence of Jesus. And when we're in that position, we're transformed to want the things that Jesus wants. When we ask these things this way, he sees that they are done for us. So you see, in the abiding, our prayers are transformed before they're ever prayed. Um, that doesn't mean that everything we pray, we get. God loves us way too much for that to happen. Tim Keller describes it this way, this dynamic of um, the kind of prayer that Jesus is talking about right there. And he says this, he says, God will only give you what you would have asked for if you knew everything that he knows. Okay? Okay. God will only give you what you would have asked for if you know everything that he knows. And so we can relax. We don't have to be afraid we pray the wrong thing. I, I pray the wrong thing. When I pray the wrong thing, do you know what happens? Nothing bad. God uses it to conform me to his image, but we can rest in the truth that what he is going to give us is exactly what we would have asked for if we knew everything that he knows. From that posture of abiding, us in Christ, Christ in us. The beautiful doctrine of union with Christ. So how do we apply this? Well, Jesus teaches that we have the privilege of abiding in him while he abides in us. You know, if, if I will renew my mind, that changes the way I read my Bible every morning. If I will renew my mind, it changes the way I preach every sermon that I ever have the privilege of preaching. If I will renew my mind with that truth, it will change the way I pray. And that's what Jesus is emphasizing here. Abide. You and me, me and you, Jesus says. And in our new position and our identity, the Father is committed to our fruitfulness. He prunes in love to produce even more fruit. So our relationship to struggles, our relationship to suffering, our relationship to persecution our relationship to godly discipline, it all changes. 
in the context of you have been invited. Abide. Because you, as you abide in him, he will abide in you. And so we're called to abide, to obey. We obey the commands to love. Jesus provides the spirit who will be the abiding presence of God in us. And then we, in obedience to his abiding, we, in obedience to his abiding word, and with the empowerment of his abiding spirit, get the privilege, get to obey the command, get to love with his love. Love him, love one another, love the world around us as his ambassador, as his representative, from this position of amazing privilege. Abide in him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you accomplish your purposes. We thank you for the glorious gospel that invites us into this amazing relationship. Father, empower us through your spirit to obey you, to love you, and to consistently abide in every way you show us. We ask this, and because we know it's what you want, we ask it with confidence because we're asking it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.